we are quite happy to, very happy to have François Xavier uh, Briol, which I'm sure not many can pronounce his name right, um, to give us a seminar here. So um, I met François Xavier a long time ago uh, in a seminar when I was doing his PhD. I think he was finishing his, he was working on, uh, I think already quadrature methods. Um, and has uh, since uh, continued working on this and other topics and uh, related to Bayesian inference. Uh, so he did his PhD in Warwick, then worked from London in Cambridge, <laughs> and, uh, and is now a, a lecturer at UCL and also group leader at the Alan Turing Institute. And today he's going to talk to us about Bayesian estimation of integrals, uh, a multitask approach the title and uh microphone is yours thank you vincent uh, thanks um so yeah as you said um i've actually been working on this for quite a while and this is probably my longest project ever or at least continuing project now i've started doing other things as well but i've still continued working on this kind of estimation of integrals um and so i think what i'll do for this talk is i'll i'll try to give a bit of a summary of what's done in this field for the first half. And then the second half will be more some more recent approach on the, the kind of multitask uh, approach. Um, so I guess there's not too many people here. So I, if, you, if you do have any questions you know, throughout the talk, feel free to interrupt me. I'm more than happy to take questions at any point in time. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, everything is clear. OK. so. The, the first part of the talk will be on this field called probabilistic numerics. And maybe some of you have heard of it. I'm not too sure. Actually, when, um, when we first met, uh, <laughs> I don't think many people had heard of it. Now, many, maybe a few more people have heard of it. So probabilistic numerics is the idea that you can see um, kind of tasks from numerical analysis as um, learning tasks or kind of statistical inference tasks. And, and I'll be explaining why that's an interesting uh, viewpoint to take um, in the next few, few slides. And this idea has also led to uh, the development of a number of algorithms um, to actually tackle problems in numerical analysis. Okay, so if I was to describe uh, numerical analysis, uh, probably a very general definition would be something like, I have a continuous mathematical quantity and I want to be able uh, to approximate it, uh, or at least to discretize it somehow, so that perhaps I can use it on my computer. Um, so in practice, this often means calculating an integral, solving an optimization problem, maybe uh, solving a linear system, or even solving a PDE or an ODE. And all of these you can really think as there's a continuous quantity that's being discretized. Um, so just to take a very simple example from uh, some Wikipedia page, uh, if you want to calculate the integral of, let's say, this black curve, so this function, what you might do is you might discretize the function by evaluating at a bunch of points and then uh, constructing an approximation of that function uh, for which the um, integral can be calculated in closed form. So in this case, it's basically the step function and so I approximate the integral of the true function with that of the step function. And as I increase the number of kind of discretization points, uh, I'm gonna get a better and better approximation of my continuous quantity, which is the function and therefore the integral. So, okay, so numerical analysis is uh, projecting some sort of continuous quantity into discrete scales. Now, if I was to, um, well, and also, yeah, kind of studying how good this projection is. Now, if I was to kind of summarize what statistics is or what learning is, what uh, kind of inference or learning is, I could probably summarize it. And again, my, my summary might be, <laughs> you know, uh, criticized by many, but let's say big level, uh, inferring some quantity of interest, which is usually some sort of parameter or something else. Uh, based on a finite amount of data from some population. Um, 
And hey, actually, what's kind of interesting is that uh, this might sound a little bit familiar given the previous definition that I've um, given you. So in both cases, there's some sort of quantity that needs to be approximated from a finite number of points. Now, it might be this continuous mathematical problem or something else. <laughs> and really, the, you can see that there are some parallels between these two general definitions. Um, and that's really what this field of probabilistic numerics is playing on. So one idea might be that we can use statistical tools, machine learning tools, to, do, um, um, to estimate um, some uh, mathematical quantities. And just to let you know, uh, there's someone unmuted uh, who's typing I can hear. So, <laughs> um, so um, in the case of, uh, so if you're a Bayesian statistician, for example, um, one thing you could do is be Bayesian about a numerical analysis. So in this case, um, what you could have is your quantity of interest is the integral and your data might be these function values. Okay, so clearly that's a statistical problem. And so I can use Bayesian methods to tackle it. And um, so I guess that's just the idea of probabilistic numerics. Now, this idea started already a long time ago. Um, I've got a couple of references here, but um, Really, you can even trace it back even earlier to the, than this. Um, I think this, this first paper by Larkin is really one of the first papers that really kind of stated that very clearly as a problem for kind of uh, statistical analysis, but even earlier uh, references kind of hint to this idea. And um, um, it's been kind of rediscovered a couple of times. So Diaconis, Percy Diaconis proposed this in 88. Uh, Tony Reagan independently also proposed it a bit later on. And a few different people throughout history have proposed this idea as a general approach to doing kind of numerical analysis. Um, these days, uh, people tend to call this Bayesian numerical methods or probabilistic numerics. And there's this paper, which is now getting a bit old, but <laughs> not so old compared to the others which gives a nice summary of, um, of what this field does and what, what are the kind of aims of this field. So I guess at this point, a valid question for, from perhaps the audience could be, am I just rephrasing the problem differently? So am I just using slightly different language uh, for the exact same thing? And partly you could say, yes, of course. So I'm just, you know, whether I call this problem a numerical analysis problem or a kind of statistical inference or learning problem. It's just a question of semantics really, but actually changing the semantics can also be quite helpful in many ways. So in some respects, no, because um, there's many things that we tend to do as statisticians, as machine learners, that numerical analysts don't really consider and that can be particularly helpful for these problems. So the first one, um, I wouldn't say that they don't do it, but um, they do it in a very different way. So the first thing is quantifying epistemic uncertainty. Uh, this is the, the sentence that you hear in every single talk about Bayesian statistics. So you're basically using probability distributions to represent uncertainty. And that in some way can be quite desirable compared to what people do in numerical analysis. So in numerical analysis, what they would tend to do is some sort of worst case error bounds. So they would tell you, okay, I have this class of function and I have this algorithm. In the worst case, my integration error will be this quantity. And the quantity is usually very large relative to what you should really expect your method to do. So here using kind of distributions can be helpful um, in that respect. And here epistemic uncertainty uh, really means that um, you only have a finite number of data points. So you haven't observed, let's say your integrand infinitely many times. Um, okay, so that's the first advantage. The second advantage is that you can propagate your uncertainty. So let's say you're being Bayesian about numerical methods. Um, well, in this case, if you're doing already, let's say some sort of Bayesian machine learning that requires computing some expectation, 
solving an optimization problem or a linear system. If you're being Bayesian about both the numerics and the inference, you can combine these two sources of uncertainty um, simply using, well, Bayes' theorem. Um, and that can be, that can allow you to be a bit more realistic about your overall uncertainty. So what's done very often is that Bayesian statisticians, they're being Bayesian about the inference part, but not Bayesian about the numerics, which means that there's a source of uncertainty that's not really being accounted for. Now, it might be that it's fine in, in some cases, but in other cases, maybe that could uh, create some sort of issues. And finally, um, if you're being Bayesian, uh, well, you can start having all sorts of techniques that you know, um, I'm sure many of you already work with, anything to do with active learning, using your uncertainty to kind of uh, collect more data. All of that can, all of these tools can be brought to uh, numerical analysis. Okay, so what I'm going to do uh, today is have a, a kind of more detailed look at one of these problems of, of numerical analysis, which is the integration problem that I talked about. And um, so just to fix a little bit of notation, I'm gonna have some function from Rd to R, uh, which is going to be my integrand F, and I'm going to want to integrate F against some distribution P. So, that's very common in, in kind of computational stats and machine learning. So you might want to marginalize out some variables, calculate some posterior expectations, calculate some model evidence or anything like that. It will always be some sort of integral. And most of the times these integrals are going to be intractable. So the most common approach to do this um, is to do some sort of Monte Carlo estimator. So the simplest one is kind of standard Monte Carlo where you sample from p and then you use some sort of sum uh, of, p, of function values. Uh, more generally, you could use any sort of quadrature rule, which is just a linear combination of f at some points in x. And as long as you pick those weights and those points sensibly, and I'm not really going to go into what sensibly means, uh, you will have that this quantity converges uh, to the true integral as n grows. So maybe if you're quite an expert in Monte Carlo methods, you can go into much more complex things like quasi Monte Carlo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that will improve your performance of the estimator and they will all be of this form. Okay. Now, the problem with what I've just said is really what happens in very expensive settings. And I think that's really the case where these Bayesian numerical methods really will stand out compared to alternatives. So if, if we go back for a second to, to this previous slide, here I've said this quantity converges to the truth as n goes towards infinity. And usually you have guarantees on how fast this happens, only asymptotic guarantees, so for n going towards infinity. But there are many, many scenarios where um, maybe the n equals infinity case is a bit unrealistic. So one example that I worked on quite a while ago now is this example where uh, these uh, scientists at St. Thomas's Hospital in London, they developed these heart models, which are, well, the, the overall aim is to have some sort of model um, of people's hearts. So they might collect some data to try to represent a model of your heart on the computer and with these models, maybe try to figure out what would happen if you had to do some sort of surgery on it. So that's their ultimate goal. So in order to do that, they have to develop these quite complex models of how the heart works. And in practice, they're just coupled systems of differential equations, and they can be really expensive to, to work with. So um, here, the, the one we looked at was actually quite a simple model. It was not anywhere near the most advanced models that they use. And already they're just getting samples for the sort of integrals that they were interested in, getting uh, about a thousand samples um, was costing about a hundred thousand CPU hours. So here, if you had to do that every single time for a new patient, and this is again, remembering that it's probably one of the simpler models you would ever want to use, clearly you cannot rely on anything to do with asymptotics because n is never going to be anywhere near infinity. 
And in fact, even a thousand is probably infeasible in practice. And so that means that a lot of these Monte Carlo methods or other quadrature rules that people look at, um, although they have some very nice guarantees in the asymptotic regimes, might not work so well in the non-asymptotic regime. And this is where I think these Bayesian tools can be quite helpful. So ideally what we'd want is an estimate of this integral, which is accurate even for small n and presents some sort of measure of uncertainty. So especially imagine if you're making some sort of medical decision with your estimates of the integral, you definitely don't want to be getting this uncertainty wrong. And so that's why um, Bayesian methods might be interesting to look at. So the simplest uh, approach to do this, and the, one of the most common approaches to do this, uh, falls under what's called uh, Bayesian quadrature. So the way this works is imagine that I have this red curve here, which is my integrand f. What I would do is simply posit uh, some sort of prior on this function f, which is any sort of usually non-parametric prior um, um, for f. I am then gonna collect some function values to get to posterior. And here, obviously the simplest, well, not obviously, but maybe naturally uh, for I think many of the people in the audience would be to use something like a Gaussian process. And from this, um, you can get a posterior on f, which also implies a posterior on the value of the integral, because integration is just a linear operation. And so you're just kind of projecting this infinite dimensional Gaussian to one dimension, which is the value of the integral. So you're going to get a, a new Gaussian, um, which here is represented on the bottom. And it's going to start to concentrate more and more on the true value of the integral, which is this dotted line, um, as you get more data. So that, that's a, just a sketch of how this works. Um, so there's a couple of references here um, for this uh, algorithm. It's also sometimes called uh, Bayesian Monte Carlo because uh, you can just use Monte Carlo samples um, for, the, for the kind of function values of the GP. Um, in, in a fairly recent paper uh, here, um, we kind of gave an overview of this method and where it's kind of at uh, kind of more recently. It was first introduced in 91, so there's been quite a lot of work since. And I think this paper can be interesting to look at more specifically because it was published with, with discussion in statistical science, which basically meant that a lot of kind of computational statisticians went and uh, criticized a lot this method and uh, said all sorts of things about it. Um, so I think it can be a, a quite nice way of seeing the advantages and disadvantages of the method uh, through, through this discussion. So in practice, if I use, if my, pre, if my prior was a GP prior with mean zero and kind of K, the posterior mean on this integral is just something like this where here I'm using, so K is the kernel of my GP, and here I'm using kind of vectorized notation. So F of X is just F of X1, F of X2, F of Xn as a vector. And this is the gram matrix. And here the integral is applied kind of uh, element by element of that vector. So I have, uh, this is the mean of my Gaussian and the variance also has a closed form solution. Okay, so um, I just thought before moving on to the kind of main topic of my, of my talk, what I do is give you a small um, kind of highlight of some of the kind of more recent advances in this field. So what are people kind of trying to do at the moment or in the last, let's say five years? So one line of research has been on providing theory for, for Bayesian quadrature. And I think this was something that was lacking initially. Um, I remember when I started my PhD around 2015, um, when I was talking with computational statisticians about this method, they were really dubious about it because you couldn't really provide any kind of theoretical guarantees on how good the performance of the method would be. And so now there's been quite a long line of work on this. Um, so here I've kind of highlighted some of the main papers 
um, on this topic. And they are all kind of this general form, which might look to a little bit scary, but I'm just gonna break it down a little bit for you. So on the left-hand side, you have integration error. So this would be the difference between the Bayesian quadrature um, um, estimator and the true value of the integral. And this can be upper bounded by uh, these three terms. So the first term is just a constant. Um, usually you will not really know what this constant is, um, but it will depend on the kernel hyperparameters and not anything else. So it won't depend on the integrand, on the number of data points or anything like that. Then there'll be two terms, uh, h of x and rho of x, and they're terms that uh, describe geometric properties of the point sets that you use. So h of x um, describes how far away, well, both of these basically describe how far away points in the domain are and how well they are spread across that domain. Um, and the other terms are um, the smoothness of the integrand, so tau of f. So this just tells you how many derivatives does the integrand have, and tau k minus and tau k plus relate to the smoothness of the kernel uh, that you're using. So through this, you can just look at the point sets that you're using for your GP, plug in the values of h of x and rho of x here, uh, plug in um, the smoothness of the kernel and of the function, and then you get an upper bound on the integration error. Now, as I said, Often you won't know exactly what this upper bound is because this is um, maybe intractable, but you might know how these quantities decrease as n goes towards infinity. So in particular, um, you can show that the integration error decreases as usually for something like Monte Carlo points as n to the minus alpha over d, where d is the dimension of the domain and alpha is the smoothness of the true integrand. Um, now, there's various kind of variations on these results that are in these various papers, and they each have slightly different assumptions on you know, um, the function, on the domain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think what's quite interesting is that these papers, they've not only kind of done theory for Bayesian quadrature, but actually to do this, you basically need to do theory for Gaussian process uh, regression and interpolation. So some of these uh, results, I mean, I know the last one a bit more because it's my own paper, but we actually have to do quite a lot of theory for GPs, which I think can be used in many other fields. So there's also implications, for example, for Bayesian optimization or just standard GP regression. And you can derive fairly general results that even include cases where, let's say your likelihood is misspecified. Um, maybe the smoothness of your, that you've assumed the function has is misspecified and all sorts of other assumptions. Um, you can study what the impact of kind of breaking these assumptions is, um, which I think is very nice. Okay, so that, that's one of the developments. Um, another one of the developments has been uh, pushing a little bit more on the kind of um, software side of things. And so there's recently been this new package called Problem, um, which is a Python package for implementing probabilistic numerics method. Um, and it does not only the, the integration side of things, but also linear systems, differential equations, et cetera. And the idea in the kind of long run will be to have one package which implements most probabilistic numerics algorithm that people might be interested in, just all in kind of as a black box so that you don't need to kind of go and learn about how these algorithms work to use them. Um, so I am mostly a very minor contributor to this package. Um, most of it is being run out of Philip Hennig's group in Tübingen, um, and Jonathan Fenger is the, the kind of main author of this package. Um, so, so that's the kind of two sides of things that have moved a little bit uh, in recent years. Um, and now for the rest of the talk, what I'll do is I'll mostly present one other line of research um, that I think has been kind of enabled by seeing numerical analysis problems as kind of inference problems. And I think it's 
well, I'll get onto it, but it's something that isn't so natural from a numerical analysis viewpoint, but it's really obvious once you start seeing it from a learning viewpoint. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to kind of open for questions if there are any or any comments or anything like that. Um, and then I'll move on to the second part of the talk. No? Okay. <clears throat> so um, the second part of the talk is about um, how you can use multitask learning for numerical integration. And so the, the kind of main premise of this part of the talk is that pretty much always uh, numerical integration tasks are tackled independently. Um, so as a numerical analyst, usually you kind of see uh, a problem as just being one function, one distribution and calculating the interval. But they very often, because it's abstracted this way, they don't spend much time thinking about how it could be, how it's actually used in practice. Now in practice, there's many, many situations where you don't just have to do one integration problem, but you actually have to do several integration problems, either simultaneously or even sequentially. And, and the fact that you have to do several problems, not just one, means that you can be a little bit clever with how you kind of allocate computational resources, um, how you maybe share computational resources to tackle these various integrals at the same time. So in this particular sketch uh, here, um, so I have two functions and um, two distributions. The distributions are actually the same. They're given by this heat map. And the functions are slightly different. You can tell if you look around here in the image, um, but they are obviously very closely related. Now, from this picture, it does seem obvious that if I would, if I wanted to estimate the integral of this function and this function, well, function evaluations from the left-hand side would obviously help to approximate the integral from the right-hand side. Because they're so close to one another, um, I might be able to kind of be a bit careful with how I pick my function evaluations here to improve my approximation of this function. Now, in practice, this sorts of problems uh, happen a lot. So just to give some examples, um, maybe I want to calculate some sort of posterior uh, expectation. Um, so let's say a posterior mean. And um, maybe I'm slightly unsure about which prior I should be using. So I might want to check what's the impact of changing my prior a little bit. So in that case, I could have a, a fixed prior and a perturbed prior which would mean that I end up with two integration problems. Now, obviously, if I, if I change um, the prior only a little bit, I wouldn't expect my posterior expectations to be very different, right? And so in that case, clearly, I'm getting two related integration problems, which in this case uh, would be with different distributions, uh, the, same, the same function, but different distributions. Um, Another example might be uh, maybe I've collected n data points and I calculate my posterior expectation. Um, and then suddenly someone gives me uh, an extra data point and I want to calculate the posterior expectation with n plus one data points. Now, I've already spent all of this time calculating the first expectation. It does seem natural that I would want to reuse that information to calculate the, the second expectation with one more data point. Um, so that, that could be, let's say, some applications in, in Bayesian statistics. Um, in practice, I, I like to, well, I, I'm quite interested in working with large physical models. So um, one thing that's quite popular there is this notion of multi-fidelity model. So that's usually when you have um, um, large physical models, very often kind of parameterized by differential equations. And so you can never really work directly with the exact model, but you use with the model discretized with a solver. And what people tend to do is have really fine meshes so that the model is very accurate. Um, the, the approximation of the model is very accurate. Uh, but that tends to be really, really expensive. So usually there's some sort of ladder 
where you can get uh, more and more uh, accurate models, but that are also more and more computationally expensive. And sometimes what people do is they like to use some evaluations of the cheap model uh, combined with evaluations of the more expensive model to kind of balance computational costs and accuracy. So I've been working on this a little bit with a colleague at UCL who works on kind of tsunami prediction. And there what they do is they, <clears throat> they simulate the tsunami to predict you know, how big is this wave going to be when it hits some important city. Um, now, if you use the most accurate model with the smallest mesh, it might take several hours to predict this. And therefore, it's completely useless to that city because <laughs> no one had time to evacuate. So what they do is they might run it a couple of times with, um, let's say, the slightly um, less accurate uh, version um, and only once or twice with the more accurate version of the model. And they, they kind of combine these to, to kind of calculate uh, more precise um, quantities such as the expected height of the wave. Um, so in this case, you, know, you could have a proximate model and the exact model being your two functions. And in all of these cases, really leveraging this information will really help, but it can also be a bit more expensive. So usually um, you would only do it if you think that it's really going to be necessary. And again, I think that's why uh, these methods are, again, really particularly useful for very expensive models or very expensive uh, problems. Um, so once we, we start thinking about it as a multi-task problem, we can have this kind of general formulation of the problem, which is imagine you have a sequence of integrands f1 to ft. You also have a sequence of integration measures, p1 to pt. And what you're interested in is uh, this sequence of integral values. And you're going to estimate those using evaluations of f1 to ft, possibly at different points, but at some points in, in x. Now, this is something that people don't really do in full generality with Monte Carlo methods. And I think it's because it's not so natural uh, to present as a kind of numerical analysis problem, but it's kind of natural, you know, if, if you're a kind of statistician or machine uh, to think about, okay, I have multiple tasks. I'm just going to throw everything I have at it with multitask learning. Um, and I don't really know of any method that can do this in full generality uh, in the field of Monte Carlo methods. Um, so what we did back in 2018 was think about how can you generalize this Bayesian quadrature algorithm to multiple related integrals. And the very obvious way to do this is just using a multi-output GP instead of a scalar-valued GP. Can I ask you a quick, um, sorry sure. to jump in. Uh, you, you mentioned it's a sequence, is the sequential part important here or? Uh, no, not at all. So um, um, I could just say a set of functions or um, I see, I see, because you mentioned more like kind of the incremental version and that that would fit in here, but. Uh, yes, so you could have them kind of want to calculate them sequentially, but it doesn't, you don't really have to. You could want to calculate this uh, simultaneously. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so with multi output Gaussian processes, what I'm going to do is just see my my t different integrands as a vector values function f. And then I'm just going to do regression on this vector valued function f. Or oh, actually, I'm going to do interpolation with vector valued function f. And I can do this with um, a multi output GP. So here, the multi output GP um, just has a, a vector valued mean function and matrix valued kernel. Now, if I do that, I'm going to get very similar uh, expressions uh, to the ones I had before, where now the only difference is that I have uh, big Ks instead of small Ks. And here I've not written down uh, what each of these quantities are, but they are the kind of what you would expect they are, but it would just otherwise take the whole page because they are quite ugly. Um, and so all these matrices are going to be much, much bigger. Um, 
but uh, the, the kind of expressions are very similar to the scalar case. The main difference is that in the scalar case, you have a univariate Gaussian on the solution of the integral. And now you're going to have a multivariate Gaussian with this mean and this covariance. OK. So we did this, and uh, we tried it on a range of problems, including this um, computer graphics example. I'm just going to check how long I'm OK. I still have a lot of time. Um, this computer graphics example, where I think this is one of these examples where kind of sharing information across tasks is really helpful. So this example is, um, is an example um, where in this field called global illumination. And it's to do with, imagine that you want to simulate some sort of environment on your computer. So it might be like a video game or, or something like that, or maybe a, a Zoom background or something like that. Um, what, you, what you'll need to do to, to kind of make that uh, realistic looking, or one of the things you'll need to do is decide how much light to put on each of the pixels. Now, this will depend actually on the kind of physical properties that we expect this environment to have. So for example, there might be some sun that's here at the back and it's gonna therefore make these, this area lighter, but this darker because it's blocked by the stones or something like that. Now we want this to be done realistically so that you know, the person looking at this environment uh, thinks that it's realistic and satisfies the laws of physics. Um, and to decide how much light to put at each of these points, what you do is you do an integral over all possible directions uh, with respect to which light could be arriving on that pixel uh, and then reflecting towards the camera. So I'm not really gonna go into a lot of details as to what all of these things are, but basically you have integrals of a function with respect to some distribution and people do Monte Carlo on this for each pixel of an image, so each frame, uh, you'd have to do three integrals, one for each of the main colors, uh, blue, red, and green. Um, now, here, you'd have to do this for every picture. So if I have my camera, and let's say I have some sort of video game, I'm going to start moving the camera, and it's going to, um, I'm therefore going to have to do this every single time there's a new frame. So clearly here, there's a lot of related integration problems. You could think, well, for once, if I start moving the camera kind of smoothly uh, through time, I'm going to get very similar amount of light coming from one point in the, um, in the domain. Um, also, points that are close by will, be very, will have a similar amount of light. Um, and yeah, so that's already a lot of integrals that are related. And so, here, what we did is we tried, we picked a couple of points in, in this domain for, for this environment map, and we calculated these integrals, first comparing Monte Carlo and Bayesian quadrature. So that's these black line and the red line. And you can see that already um, with the red line, you get a slightly better performance than the black line. And this is purely using the fact that we we kind of used an appropriate GP for, for the sort of integrand. So we kind of encoded some of the properties that we know this function has uh, in the kind of choice of kernel, and we got slightly better performance already. And now what we started doing is kind of moving the camera slightly and using uh, kind of sharing information across integration task as I'm moving. And this is what I get with the blue lines and the pink lights. So the first one is two integration tasks shared, and the pink one is five. And you can see that's already here. You know, if I don't move my camera too quickly, I'm going to get a lot more information from sharing the, the kind of data across tasks, which significantly reduces my, my error. And so I think this, this one particularly well, illustrates particularly well the possible advantages of this kind of sharing of of information across integration tasks. Can I ask you uh, maybe quickly here uh, what sort sure. of um, uh, what sort of multi-output kernel? What sort of dependence across the? Uh, if I understand correctly, the integrals are uh, 
first across pixels and then across images, or where is the multi-output? Uh, so, so um, here, um, the multi-output is obtained by moving the camera slightly, and so uh, I'm getting. So I move a tiny bit, I get one function, a, a little bit more, another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I we didn't do it kind of spatially, so we could have done that as well. The problem is that the more tasks you get, the more expensive actually using these methods becomes. So then it's one of these things where you have a trade-off between kind of computation and um, kind of how good your estimate is. So the more tasks you, you put in, the better your estimate will be, but the more expensive things will get. Um, so here, there's, they're all integrals on the sphere um, and they're all integrals of this, this function, which basically tells you how much light to put on each of these pixels. Okay, so here, as I was kind of, oh, I can see someone talking, but I can't hear anything. <laughs> um, so I'll continue just in the meantime. Um, so here, the main issue is um, uh, that, you know, if you use a standard GP, you'll have an N cube cost. So here I'm kind of not assuming I'm using any sort of fancy approximate GPs. So just standard GPs, I'll have an N cube cost. But if I use a multi upper GP, I usually have an n cube t cube cost. So the more tasks I put in, the more expensive things become. Um, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, thrilled. Yeah. So on the previous slide, you were talking about how this multi output approach gives you better estimates of the integrals. Are there situations where it's useful to know like the correlation structure between your predictions? Is that like also a useful yes. feature? <clears throat> So, so in this case, um, we we kind of encoded this by so I think we use the separable kernel where and I'll get to what that is. I'm not sure for those that know um, that's good and the other ones I'll, I'll talk about it later. But we use a separable kernel where we kind of encoded correlation across tasks based on how much the camera was moving. So uh, if I was moving it a little bit, it would have high correlation. Whereas if I moved it more, it would have lower correlation. Um, now, I don't know that the choice of kernel that we had was in any way optimal. It was good enough to kind of solve this problem. Um, and obviously it would really depend on the sort of um, on the sort of problem that you have, but sometimes it's possible also to learn the kind of correlation across tasks from data. Now, with that, you have to be a little bit more careful because you usually need a bit more data to be able to learn the correlation. And then you, you kind of end up in the trade-off of, was it worth learning the correlation to actually use it or not? Um, yeah. Sorry, I meant, I meant more that, um, so after this method, you have a joint predictive distribution for your, say, say your, uh, I don't know, three or your two, your two integrals. Um, and you've argued so far that actually the, the predictions for each of the integrals is probably gonna be better if you use yeah. the joint information. But yep. you have this, I like um, the joint distribution of the two integrals. Are there ever any like any actual applications where it's beneficial to know, like how correlated your estimates are? Oh, I see. Made um, yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It might be. <laughs> uh, well, if if you do what I was kind of alluding to at the start, which is kind of propagate uncertainty of the numerics to to the final estimates, knowing something about correlation could be helpful there. Um, it can also be helpful if you're going to do any sort of active learning. So I'll mention some papers in a second, which where they, they kind of use this. So it would kind of help you a bit more there, I think. Um, yeah. But that, yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of papers that have kind of built on this, um, doing some active learning of kind of choosing how to, which integrand to evaluate, uh, where to evaluate them, et cetera. Uh, some others have also kind of designed specific uh, point sets that don't need to be learned adaptively, but can lead to very scalable um, methods to also reduce this computational cost. Um, but I think the main issue with kind of all of what's been done to date has been um, this issue, which is something I've kind of glossed over earlier, but uh, the fact that you need to be able to evaluate integrals of your kernel. So if I go back a few slides here, I was telling you that 
you can get the mean and the covariance of, um, so this should say covariance, not variance, um, of this uh, multivariate Gaussian posterior on this vector of integrals. But I didn't really say anything about how you actually calculate this thing. So here, um, integrating a kernel might be slightly simpler than integrating a function. Um, but it's still not really a given that you can do this. Um, so in particular, if you're putting a lot of effort into choosing an appropriate choice of kernel, and your distribution P is a bit more complicated than something like a uniform or a Gaussian, there's really no guarantee that you can actually calculate this, uh, or, or for that respect, this quantity. And so this is quite limiting in terms of the sort of applications that this algorithm can be used for. So to conclude the talk, the last thing I'm going to be talking about is how you can bypass this issue. Um, so the way you can bypass this issue is using this thing called Stein's method. And I don't know how many of you uh, know about this. Um, I won't have time to do a kind of full introduction to it. I'm just going to show you how that works uh, briefly. But Stein's method is a tool from well, originally probability theory to prove convergence of um, sequences of random variables. Um, but it's recently been kind of repurposed as a computational tool. So maybe some of you have heard of uh, SVGD. It's quite popular in machine learning. Um, there's also been quite a lot of work on this in the kind of kernel hypothesis testing framework. Um, and if you want a kind of introduction to this, we've written this, this kind of review paper uh, this year, well, last year now, um, uh, that you can have a look at. Um, and what I'm about to show you is how you can combine Stein's method with these kernels to get basically kernels where this can be calculated in closed form. So this idea, uh, it was originally proposed in, in these papers. Um, and what uh, I and some of my colleagues have done recently is generalize it to this multitask setting. So in practice, what I'm going to end up with, uh, and I'll show you in a second, is a kernel K0, or a family of kernels K0, which are matrix-valued kernels, uh, and for which uh, these integrals are known in the closed form. And so I can just use a GP with one of these K0s. So the way I would construct this kernel is as follows. And I am aware that this might look very ugly and scary the first time you see it. So I've just, I'm just going to break it down um, for you. So what I have is a kernel K0, which is a matrix valued kernel. Okay. Um, now, this matrix valued kernel depends on two things the ones in blue and the ones in red. <laughs> and the ones in blue are just another matrix valued kernel. Um, and some of its derivatives, OK? So that you can think of something like a matrix times a squared exponential kernel, let's say. Um, and the other thing that comes in is this red function. And the red function is this thing, which is partial derivatives of the log density with respect to which I'm integrating. Now, this thing. Um, is actually something that's very common in computational statistics and machine learning when you're interested in sampling from a posterior. So if you do something like HMC, you're going to need to use the score. And this is essentially just the score function of uh, pi i. Um, actually, it's a, it's a matrix valued function, which gives me the score for each of the pi i's. OK, so although it's quite ugly looking, I have two things, this score function and this kernel. And both of these things are usually very easy to calculate. So in particular, even if P um, is some sort of complicated Bayesian posterior, I can usually still evaluate this. And in fact, that's what most MCMC algorithms do to do sampling. So all of these components I can actually calculate. And so I now have a kernel that I can easily evaluate. And the very nice thing about it is that it has this property that um, the integrals of k0 
are always going to be zero. So by construction, I've constructed a kernel whose integral is zero and therefore known. So if I go back to where I was here, these two quantities need to be known. Well, if I put k0 here and here, I actually know these because they're both zero. So this is something we've derived in this kind of recent paper with my PhD student Su San. And um, it's a generalization of what's commonly called Stein reproducing kernel to the matrix valued case. Um, and it's particularly useful here because we can use this algorithm. And in particular, if we don't want our function to integrate to zero, I can just create another kernel by taking k0 and adding just a diagonal matrix with some different elements. And suddenly my integral of the function uh, of the functions in this RKHS will just be this vector. And this can be seen as hyperparameters that I can learn. So essentially through this construction, what I've done is created um, a space uh, of functions uh, give, uh, well, that I obtained through this k0 kernel, where I can know in closed form what the integrals will be. And um, thanks to this kernel k, I can also encode things like correlation across tasks. So I have one question. Yeah. Uh, does this tend to uh, preserve the um, properties of the samples of the GP, like regularity and things like that? Or are we changing the order of these things? Yeah, that's a very good question. So it very much depends on um, what this thing is. Um, okay. Obviously, you know, K could be something like a squared exponential time in a matrix. So you can expect that if you take a couple of derivatives, it's still going to be very smooth. So we're kind of keeping all that, and that's fine. Uh, however, it depends on what grad log p is, and that's in some way, well, fixed what grad log p is, because usually your distribution is fixed. So it depends whether the density is very smooth or not. Um, what's certainly not true is that you don't keep things like translation invariant. So this kernel is not translation invariant. Okay. Um, but things like smoothness, you can, you can basically encode smoothness by looking at what your grad log p is and choosing k accordingly uh, to enforce more regularity if you want to. Okay, given that the first term in the sum is already differentiating k, you probably decrease the order of, of regularity, right? If you start with the matern, but I, I see your point that there's also the density you're integ integrating with respect to that uh, as an impact. Oh, thanks a lot. Um, so in particular, um, one other thing that you can do is use these so-called separable kernels for K. So um, a kernel is called separable if you can write it in this form. So a matrix valued kernel is separable. If you can write it as just a matrix times a scalar valued kernel. And this case is particularly nice because <clears throat> the, the kind of functions in this RKHS you can see them as all kind of being, each of the outputs are basically functions in this RKHS and the correlation across outputs is given by this matrix B. Um, so in the case where all the integration measures are um, the same, then K0 will also be separable if I choose K to be separable. And that's kind of nice because I can just choose my B matrix again, like I was doing earlier to encode you know, how related the different tasks are. Um, so that's something you can preserve, but only if all the measures are the same. If they're not, you don't end up with something um, separable, although you'll have something that's nearly separable in the sense that um, what you lose is not very much. <laughs> so yeah, it's nearly a, a function of this point. Um, and in general, we wouldn't really recommend that you use uh, this approach if the distributions are very different from one another. You really want them to be very similar. Okay, so just to give you an example of a slightly more involved problem that, that we looked at with, with these um, kernels. So here, um, well, I'm not sure if the example is more involved. There's certainly more integration tasks. So here we're again in 
one of these wells of uh, kind of differential equation models. Um, so we have this system of differential equation, which is actually quite simple. And it has this unknown parameter theta. And uh, we get some data, which will be assumed to be normal zero with some small variance. So basically we observe this at various points, but with a little bit of Gaussian error. And one thing you might want to do as a scientist is calculate the model evidence for this model. Um, and usually for these sorts of kind of um, couple systems of differential equations, this can be quite a challenging task. So one approach to doing so is what's called thermodynamic integration. And the idea is to rewrite your model evidence as the following set of nested integrals. So you first have an integral over t, which is some sort of um, temperature. And then you have integrals with respect to a, what's called a power posterior. Now, I don't really have time to go into a lot of details as to why people do this, but basically this has been shown to be, to lead to very good estimate of this model evidence. Now, what people do is they discretize this outside integral with a quadrature rule, something like a tra trapezoidal rule. And so you end up with something of this form where I basically have a lot of function evaluations, which, well, I have a lot of terms, which are these mu's and these v's, which each are themselves integrals. Um, so the integrals of this function against the power posterior. Now, <clears throat> The power posterior is, that's basically taking a standard posterior where you've taken your likelihood to be to the power t. And so if t1 and t2 are very similar, then obviously the power posteriors will be very similar. And so you'd expect that along the sum, the, the kind of integration measures will be very, very similar to one another, and they'll get less and less similar as uh, you go through the sum. But here, since all of these are kind of integrals, so the mean and the variance, that means that in total, we have, I think, 31 uh, elements in the sum times two, that's uh, 62 integration tasks that are all being combined to estimate this one quantity. And that's what people tend to do um, as, a, as an approach to calculating this model evidence. Now, since we have all of these integrals and they're all fairly similar, well, the obvious thing here is obviously to share information across these tasks. And so what these two plots do is they compare the performance of using, um, of considering one task at a time with considering sharing across tasks. So the model evidence reported is just this one quantity. So I've kind of calculated all the integrals and then summed them in this form to get this. So here I'm plotting what happens as I increase the sample size. And this dotted line is some sort of reference. This is what I would expect to be the true value of the model evidence. And I've been able to calculate it here because my oscillator is fairly simple, but in most cases with slightly more complex models, I wouldn't be able to do that. Now, what you notice is that firstly, the kind of multitask approach um, the kind of orange lines are a lot closer to the truth. So we're already doing better. And also each, each of the box plots are a lot more centered around this truth and concentrated compared to here. So essentially here, you can see that, you know, when we've hit, uh, let's say 80 points, um, we're already doing much, much better than in this case, um, when we consider each integral separately. And in fact, in this case, you know, the, most of the estimates are not even, hit, yeah, the, the range of most of the estimates are not really hitting the truth. So here we can really see that there are significant advantages to kind of sharing across tasks. Now, one thing I've not really said is how I've set up my whole uh, kernel here. And what I've done is I've done a, a kind of separable kernel, but, I've not actually shared 62 by six, I've not created a 62 by 62 matrix. And the main reason is that this is really expensive to, to, um, to implement, but also that 
as my i cycle go up on the terms of this sum, my, my problems are going to be less and less similar. So actually, it's not really worth including everything together. So what we did was we actually split the integration problems four by four. So we did four together, four together, four together, et cetera. And here that's sufficient to kind of balance the computational increase in computational cost versus accuracy. Um, so, so that's it. Um, maybe I'll just summarize. Um, so in summary, I think Bayesian inference can be a nice way to think about numerical problems. Um, mostly because using this slightly different semantic can actually bring you different ways of approaching this problem that can be quite helpful in some settings, which have been a little bit disregarded by numerical analysts. Um, it also allows you to kind of think about how to extend existing algorithms in ways which seem very obvious to machine learners and, and statisticians, but not at all to numerical analysts. So this example of multitask learning seems like a fairly obvious thing to do, uh, but no one's really thought about integration this way previously. And um, I also want to emphasize that this whole kind of multitask integration, that's really still in its infancy. So there's only a couple of papers doing this. And I think there's really scope for a lot more work to be done there. I think most of the work will really be useful for these very expensive problems, like large physical models, um, and I'm not necessarily advocating this as like a general purpose tool. So I'm not saying every single Monte Carlo problem should be replaced by, by this, but I'm saying there are many, many models where, you know, if you're simulating a tsunami, if you're simulating some sort of heart model, where the expense of doing that really warrants putting more effort and kind of using these more advanced methods, which share information. And there's still plenty to do. So all of the theory stuff that I told you about at the start, there's not really anything for the multitask case. Um, I think there's a lot of work also to be done on kind of algorithm design to have more scalable methods. Um, and also I think we need a, a bit more work to kind of decide when is it worth uh, sharing information and when is it not worth doing so. So for example, Am I spending a lot of computational efforts sharing information for not very little gain? Or is it really worth it? I think it's often it's a bit unclear uh, for, for kind of applications. So I think that's it. Um, the two kind of main papers that I talked about on the multitask stuff is this paper back from 2018 and this more recent paper. And um, in the more recent paper, we actually don't present the method as a kind of GP method, but we present it as a kernel rate regression, although everything is the same. So I kind of presented it as a GP method for, for kind of simplicity and to put it together with the rest. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, great talk. Um, anyone has a question in the audience? Yeah, I have, I have one. Uh, it's more kind of a general probabilistic numerics question, but obviously with Bayes opt, it doesn't scale well in terms of like, the number of inputs. And I guess you have exactly the same problems here. Are, are there similar, are, are there kind of like ways around that in the literature for applying these sort of methods to so, situations in <clears throat> higher dimensional spaces? So there is not very much, <laughs> uh, to be fully honest with you. I think, um, I think there's a bit this question of for, for what we're doing, if, if you have something really high dimensional, maybe you're okay with some of these Monte Carlo methods. Now that might not be the case, but it's, to me, it's always a bit unclear. Is it really worth trying to scale these GPs to these really high dimensional problems or not? Or are there more natural approaches there? It's not too clear. I'm sure there could be some interesting things done there. Um, there's not really that much done at the moment. The question is, um, you could use some of these approximate GP methods, um, but then you would have to just re-derive what these posterior mean and posterior variance would be, and that might be a bit complicated. I don't know, I haven't really looked into it, um, but that's definitely something that could be done. Uh, and I think it's worth looking into. Uh, I think, and the main question will be, when is it worth doing that versus kind of more standard Monte Carlo methods? Mm 
Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. Um, any other questions? If not, uh, maybe I have a quick one. It's more a comment. I, uh, I find it, I'm quite curious about the last point you touched upon. And, um, I like to think uh, about what's the structure in the problem when you do multiple re regression and what structure you put in your model. So I, I'd be quite excited to see um, maybe the sort of bound you showed extended to the, the multi output. Maybe you're working on it. <laughs> and yeah. How it depends on different statistics. Now you need to care about the cross function statistic. And, and yeah. I had started. It's obviously a lot more difficult, and it's already quite difficult. <laughs> so uh, I haven't made much progress, but it's something that I'd be interested in kind of looking at more. Yes. Um, yes, it's it's yeah, it's quite a, a hard question. <laughs> so I think what you can show is that um, in most cases, the rate in the number of samples n. So let, let's say we evaluate each integrand n times. Um, I think the rate of convergence will be the same as in the scalar one as the multi-output case. But I think the constant in front of it will be much, much, much better in the multi-output. So then you have to quantify how can you kind of quantify that constant. And that usually depends on maybe some properties of B or something like that. Um, so that's kind of high level what will happen. Um, I have not finished any proofs on that, but um, this is the kind of initial direction. Um, cool. Is there any other question? Um, I don't see. And there's one thing in the chat actually that I didn't see earlier. Oh, uh, oh how's it? How's okay. it? <laughs> I guess I can, I can ask a quick one. So I've, I've used uh, multitask GPs a lot in Bayesop, in the Bayesop problems. Um, and you said you managed to do one with the uh, 64 tasks. Yeah. So 62, yeah. 62, sorry, yeah. So. What well, what was the kind of like the overall number of like like the number of points I guess for your GPs in that? So uh, are you still in like the exact GP domain? So so this is the bit where uh, so for this problem in the paper we don't actually see it as uh, we don't actually phrase it as a GP problem we phrase it as a kind of rich regression and actually to implement it what we do is we we kind of um, use uh, stochastic optimization to find uh, the weights of the kind of kernel rich regression problem. Um, so we don't really, it's slightly different, but you, if you use kind of these approximate, mm, well, if you use kind of optimization methods like that, you can scale things a lot better. Um, here, I'm sure you could do more than four. Uh, the main reason that we limited at four was because as you start changing t in your power posterior, um, the distributions are going to be more and more different. So actually, at some point, I don't have a plot here, but we have a plot in the paper where we kind of plot what these distributions look like. And they become so different that you're not really getting anything. You're not really gaining anything from, from sharing information anymore. Um, so that's, that's partly why we did it. But in general, I think also, if you start going towards that sort of number, computationally, it might be a bit more challenging if you were to solve it exactly. Um, I, I don't know, what's your experience with the kind of number of tasks? And... Yeah, I've, I've never really gone more than five or 10, I guess. But these have been just with kind of exact GPs for an optimization task. Yeah, yeah. So here, what I'm saying is we, we although we have 62, we only split in groups of four, right? So <laughs> as, yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting. There's some interesting work, I can't remember if it was this year's Merips or last year's about, they did, some guys optimized some images. So they had kind of thousands of outputs. Um, and they had a cool multitask GP to do that. It was kind of very lightly parameterized, which meant they were able to learn it. Okay. Um, mm. So there is that kind of thing available. So something else that I found with the multitask for Bayes Opt, it was often useful, even if the tasks weren't like positively correlated, 
It was also yeah. useful to know if they were very negative with the correlators. Yes. Um, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I, I guess I guess that's not relevant to um, these two problems so much. Well, you could have the functions being yeah negatively correlated. Um, I guess so. It really depends also on the inherent correlations between tasks, right? So in this problem, because we were moving the camera only a little bit, uh, <laughs> the correlation was enormous across tasks. So you know the gains are enormous. And here, if I was to use hundred tasks, then I would get something that's you know, <laughs> it's way down here uh, because there's generally a lot of correlation across the various tasks. So it's not just about what you can do with the GP. It's also about you know, <laughs> The underlying correlation of your problem. Yeah. Any other question? Or no? Very good. Um, any other question? Yeah. Okay. Seems like we've uh, <laughs> exhausted. Um, so maybe we can, uh, unless you have closing comments, we can uh, thank you, uh, thank you again for for your time and very nice talk. Uh, Thanks for having me.